Welcome to Unmasking Dementia Lived Experiences, a podcast featuring families who have navigated the challenges of caring for loved ones with dementia. Through heartfelt stories, we delve into trials, triumphs, and wisdom gained along the way. My name is Christiana Eggy. I'm a registered nurse, dementia advocate, author of children's book specializing in dementia education, owner of reputable memory care facilities in Toronto, Canada, as well as the founder of a Rose for Grandma Wellness Hub, a charitable organization that caters to the needs of communities of Black, Indigenous, and people of color facing the challenges of dementia. While each journey is unique, sharing experiences offers strength and encouragement. Professionals will light our way towards care, management, and possibly prevention of dementia. Join us as we raise awareness, offer support, and empower the people that are going through the challenges of dementia and will unravel the complexities of dementia together. So tonight, I'm excited to introduce my very good friend, June, a remarkable woman who epitomizes the true essence of love and compassion. See, during the very difficult times of my life, about five years ago, When I lost my husband, June was going through the challenges of dementia with her mom as well. But she stepped out of her own trials and she came to me with another mutual friend one day to surprise me. So they they came with an offer that I could not refuse. They offered to help me plant my garden. (laughs) They don't live in the same neighborhood, so it did not look that bad. It's just out of the goodness of their hearts. Like June is that person that loves to give. And it's very impactful when you are going through difficult times and you find a time or you find it in your heart to offer help to somebody else. And so that was exactly what they did for me and still goes on for these years that we have been together. And another thing that happened, uh, one you know, summer Sunday, I was at church and I was somehow ambushed by grief. If you've been through grief, uh, you know that sometimes you do get these times that just crawl up on you. So I was just sitting down and suddenly I had flashes of my wedding day and the christening of my children. And then I the flash went to my husband's casket laying in front of the altar. I was completely overwhelmed. When I left church, I reached out to the children. And of course, they you know, rallied around me with love and support. And um, so I went on. I felt a little bit better. I went home. What do you know? June showed up that evening with two lovely baskets of hanging flowers. And she said she was in the Niagara Falls area. She saw these beautiful plants and thought of me. Can you imagine that? You know, that really made me feel so good. So this is to say that, you know, we never know what people are going through. It is so important to try to reach out to others, especially when you know that you have friends or family that are on the dementia journey. It is so important, you know, to reach out, you know, offer to go sit with a loved one while the caregiver goes for a walk or bring home-cooked meal, or even other food or groceries uh, for them, because I know we all have busy lives. You never know what someone is going through, and you may be just the the breath of sunshine that that person (laughs) needs. So thank you so much, June. I do appreciate everything you've done along the way. So um, June is a mother of four and the only child of a remarkable woman a nurse whose passion for work was matched only by her strength and confidence. Her mother led a life of independence and privacy, embodying resilience in every aspect. 
Little did they know the subtle signs of dementia was already weaving their way into their lives. Camouflaged amidst her daily routine, it wasn't until that fateful day when she ventured out into the cold, only to become disoriented and lost. That was when the harsh reality of her condition unveiled itself. That pivotal incident catapulted the family into an unforeseen journey, one fraught with uncertainty and emotional turmoil. From navigating the bewildering landscape of retirement homes to the heart-wrenching decisions surrounding nursing care, each encounter with, healthcare, with the healthcare system served as a poignant reminder of the fragility of life. Denial often masked the severity of the situation, but as the weight of her mother's illness became undeniable, June found herself grappling with feelings of frustration, doubt, and guilt. Actually, our mutual friend Peggy, she has she raves about June. She tells me she has never encountered a daughter as loving, caring determined and dedicated as June. She tells me the level of care that she showed her mother is unparalleled. And I, I'm telling you, June did a lot for her mother and uh, she is going to share some of her story with us. Professionally, however, she's a senior manager across many disciplines over the past 30 years plus, though she doesn't look a day older than 30. <laughs> She has, a degree. <laughs> she has a degree in economics and a background in accounting with a strong technology awareness and partnership. She has been a project manager, held several managerial roles in finance, third party risk management, and currently a director in contract management in a large financial organization. She is also a strong advocate for the Black community. She has a website which aims to bring information to the Black community to empower and enable this community that needs so much information, especially around dementia. Yes. Well, I'll have to and, um, thank you. Thank you. I'll have to make sure that that's a highlighted part of, our, of my website. Thank you so much, um, Christiana, for, for that um, tremendous uh, introduction. It um, It's humbling. Before I actually get into anything, though, I think everyone needs to know just the kind of person you are. Kind to the, the deepest depth, I think, that I've, I've encountered anyone. You're the one who goes out of your way just to be so nice to the folks. So I think it's reciprocated. I'm spirit-led. You talk about the incidents um, in which I came to you to help. There's just an inner voice that speaks to me that said I needed to go. And so I followed that voice. And so I just think it's all the great things that you've done that God speaks through other people and come to you at the time that you need them. So I don't take much credit for me showing up at your door. I, it's, it's the voice that was inside my head that said I needed to go and see you. Thank you for listening to that voice because those <laughs> were two, because I'm a very positive person, you know, I sort of handle things really well, but those two days that you did come to me were really difficult days for me. So thank you. I'm glad God used you and you said yes. So. Yep. And I pray for him to use me in whatever way he sees fit. So <laughs> be careful what you pray for. He's listening. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, so anyway, get into your journey with your mother. Um, yes. Tell us uh, about your experience with dementia. Like you you, you had one drastic um, 
introduction or impact of the heart disease, yeah. you know, but I'm sure there were other sort of things that you had missed or something along the way. So tell us your whole experience, you know, not everything at once, but yeah. how, you, how you coped and how it impacted yourself and your family. You know, I think my mom was the last person I thought would get dementia. She had that, I, I called it elephant memory. She would remember things from her childhood. She talks so much about her grandmother and all the positive experience. She just loved that woman with all her heart and soul. And so all the details and the very vibrant description she, she portrays of her well, it was incredible. So when dementia actually came knocking at our door, it wasn't something that I would recognize. In fact, I didn't really know much about dementia. So the beginning of this journey with my mom was really one of discovery, was shock, disappointment, guilt, advocacy at, at the end of, end of the day. So I didn't know much. And I think I had to start learning a lot. So what you're doing today for folks is so, so tremendously important. I missed, I think I rationalized a lot of the things. I rationalized the fact that her bills weren't being paid on time and she would call and they're going to cut off her phone. I rationalized the fact that she left the pot in the stove and at one point the fire department had to be called. She was living in a condo by herself. I rationalized the fact that one particular day when I was taking her home, she was she was a cancer patient. So I was coming back home from the hospital with her. And as I, as I was entering her street, she said, you know, I came here the other day and I didn't know where I was. Mm -hmm. And I'm looking back at it now and I should have seen the signs. But I didn't. Now, I rationalize it all the way. But there was a pivotal point that took me on this journey of realization that something is really wrong. She got lost, and a good Samaritan actually found her on the road, on the street, at a time when the weather was cold, mm. and she wasn't appropriately dressed. So he took her in, he went on social media and found, um, found my son, who then called me and said, sort of, grandmother is over by this stranger. Anyway, long story short, she ended up in the hospital a bit frostbitten. Mm. And in that encounter, the social worker at the time at the hospital said she cannot be on her own any longer. So that now took me into, it's my gosh. It's it's a bit of a, a shock. So I had to immediately look for caregiver to come. I was at that point trying to bring somebody into the condo with her so she could stay in her own space. And I think the sticker shock of that experience was um, undeniable that I, this is not sustainable. I can't afford to pay someone around the clock to be with her in her own place. So I took her, took her home and she was with me for under a year. And during that time, I enrolled her in memory and company. Now, Memory and Company is this organization that's partnering with universities to study dementia and trying to slow down the progression of dementia. And it was actually a great organization, but they're short term in terms of their the, the time you spend with them. It wasn't a long term facility where she could stay for a long time. So I was looking for other alternatives, and that led me to looking at numerous retirement homes. At that time, she wasn't really ready for what I thought was long-term facility. So I looked for a retirement home and must have looked at over a dozen all across the greater Toronto area. And then finally landed on one that was close to her condo. And maybe it was a mistake because she saw her condo every day and wanted to leave the facility. Um, anyways, she was there. She was a nurse, so she actually acted as a, as a nurse in that facility. Many people didn't even realize she was a resident there. And it wasn't until one day she disappeared. She was gone for 19 hours. There was a command post set up in the shopping plaza, 
I was handing out flyers. I was on CP24 <laughs> appealing for people to um, see if they find her. We'll put her picture up. 19 hours later, the police found her pretty close to where she used to work as a nurse. Mm-hmm. That's the thing with dementia is that there's this memory for that to take them back almost en route, mm-hmm. the route to take them back to the place that they're used to. When she um, when she came back and I said, oh, so you were, how did you feel? Were you afraid when you were lost? And she's like, I was not lost. <laughs> My mom is one of those. She talks as if she's British. I'm not, I was not lost. <laughs> <laughs> So she didn't. She didn't think she was lost, but it was one of those very um, heart wrenching moments. Mm-hmm. And at that point, she then was labeled as wandering. She could no longer stay in that facility. So mm-hmm. the journey then started for long term care, and that's a whole different experience. Looking at long term care, reading all the reviews, and which one is is the the best long-term care. Um, I ended up with one that was close to home, had great ratings. Um, Because she was classified as wandering, they wanted to put her in a lockdown area. And it's like I didn't really have much choice at that point, it seemed. So I reluctantly left her there, but shortly after her being there, they realized she wasn't going to (laughs) survive on that floor. So we had to move her into a, a more normalized space, but she flourished in. Um, and she was there for a good while, again, acting as a nurse. And they actually encouraged her to go around with them as a nurse. Mm-hmm. Um, she was thinking that they were her patient and they loved her um, for doing that. The, the pivotal point in that relationship happened when one of the residents assaulted her. Hmm. And then nobody believed her, and she was very angry. Now, with my mom, because she she relayed what happened on a daily basis with such vividness that I sometimes thought she was misdiagnosed. The the things that maybe make it look as if she was um, dementia was the nesting. So she'll take everything out of the drawers and put it on the bed. Um, she would tuck little things into tissue boxes and things like that. So it it was quite a journey. The, the, the nursing home episode left a stain on my heart and my brain. <laughs> it was not, not a good experience. And then COVID came and made that a nightmarish experience. And during that time, she lost her speech. So she lost her ability to walk. And one fateful day, someone from the nursing home called and said, June, it's almost like she yelled at me. Like, it wasn't a yell. It's like she commanded, you have to come now and take your mother out of this place. Wow. And so I didn't hesitate. It's like a command that I could not resist. So I called up one of these companies that, um, and they're, they're like an evac. Like I couldn't use a regular transportation. And it really was a time when I wasn't really even supposed to take her out because it was COVID. Mm-hmm. But they allowed me to take her out. She didn't have COVID. People were dying around her. That was one of the reasons that I got the call. She came home with me, um, got the place not set up appropriately at that point. But the day after she came home, because she looked malnourished, during COVID, people really suffered in those nursing homes because mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. The, the caregivers were sick. Um, they had part-time workers coming in. My mom was hard to, to feed, so I don't think she was eating. So when, when she came home, the day after, it was feeding her, and she passed out. And that was terrifying. Mm. Uh, so got her to the hospital. She was in there for a month. The worst part of the journey happened after the hospital. Because while she was there for for um, a month, she developed bed sore. Mm. Which um, just took her down a path that was 
point of no return. So for me, the dementia journey was, the dementia was not the most difficult part of it. The most difficult part was dealing with wound care, the system, and a whole host of other other issues, which makes me now the advocate, but I need to be. After the after she passed, I said I was going to write a book. I, I still plan to do it. Yeah, you should. You should still do that. You see, the thing about dementia is, is, it's not that it's a new thing, but it's just it's something that is not talked about much. And like you said, you did not know what was happening, you know, you, you know, the, the little things, sometimes, um, families, especially, um, even sometimes family will enable their loved ones when they're going through things and the denial, not accepting you were rationalizing. So mm -hmm. the, the important thing about this podcast is when other people that are going through this journey, hear about experiences of other guests or even people that are not on the journey yet. When something exactly. starts to happen, they'll be able to catch on more quickly. So that is why I'm bringing this out so that people can hear and learn from other mm -hmm. people's experiences because dementia is so difficult to diagnose in the beginning. You know, a lot mm -hmm. of people will say, in hindsight, my mom did yeah. that. I did that. I just, I didn't know, you know, and so yeah. to the individual that is going through the process themselves, they cover up, right? Yep. Like, oh, exactly. mom yeah. says she's going to the grocery store to get uh, maybe vegetables. She comes back yep. and no vegetables. She go, oh, I changed my mind, you know, because they're trying, they, they also, and that, that initial part is really, really tricky, but it's yeah. really important to just be more, um, tuned into that, especially when you've heard things other people have talked about and, um, you know, just seek help. Yeah, it's yeah. better to err in error, right? Like, you know, if you're not sure, go to the doctor, let them try. And there's um the GAIN clinics in the Scarborough Health Network where you can actually refer yourself or refer your family member to those clinics to get assessed. So I guess the more we talk about dementia, the more it will become a household name and then the more people will learn more about the little things that we, we sort of overlook. But by the same token, I want to say, if you're misplacing your keys and you know you've misplaced your <laughs> key, that's not a sign of dementia because like someone loses their key, oh, are you developing dementia? It's actually not a joke. You know, it's nothing to laugh about. But when you are actually experiencing dementia, you won't even realize that you've lost your keys. That's the difference, yeah. right? That's so, that's good to know. Mm -hmm. <laughs> because I keep like, losing my keys and I'm thinking, oh my gosh, I'm starting my dementia journey. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah. caring for your mother, it's it's emotionally really tasking when you are saying this independent woman that, you know, was so, um, how would I put it, so hardworking and, you know, just resilient and determined and everything. And she was a caregiver. And now the caregiver is the care receiver. How mm -hmm. did that make you feel? And did you remember to put on your own oxygen mask? Did you remember your own self-care at that time? You know, it's, I think when you're going through these things, you don't even think about it necessarily. To me, it was like going through, it's almost like you're in a war. You're just fighting to get through and survive. And many folks, like our friend Peggy, would say, oh, you're such a um, hero or saint or whatever the word is. And I didn't feel like that. In fact, it, it didn't feel like I was deserving of any praise. It's just, you just do what you have to do. It is emotionally taxing, but I think I didn't feel the weight of the impact of the emotion until it was, I had stepped out of it. And then it felt, it, yeah, it felt like you've been through a battle. Um, 
having said that, there were there were folks there. I had friends who I could bounce things off and vent when things weren't going properly. And so I had that as a as my resource, so to speak. But it was it was um an emotional journey. I wouldn't wish this disease on, on anybody. It is. It is exhausting. It is a disease, especially watching lo your loved one forget who you are, you know, and so forth. Yeah. Um, so and she, could, she, she you, couldn't even speak, which is one of the things was hard to deal with. You mentioned um, about friends being um, sort of your resource, um, uh, being one of the ways that you had some sort of resource or some help or whatever were there any community organizations that you could turn to were there any like was there anyone in the community who actually sort of was a sounding um, board for you like a professional that you could talk to or somebody who, who could guide you or maybe you know just give you um advice on what to do oh. um it there, there were there were some i mean in the in the initial stage i mentioned memory and company i think the folks there were really really good in terms of talking about dementia and trying to kind of um mitigate some of the the kind of the um detrimental decline or shorten it, lessen it. So those folks, those were folks that was were good to talk to. Um, there were organizations like Help for Mom that I would call and ask for information. They were more to set up um, set up care. So they were a good resource in terms of navigating the care that I would need and who to speak to and so on. The community care had some resource, but I found I was fighting with them more than they were giving me, <laughs> giving me help. Um, I think it would have been nice to know all the resources that were available to me in the community. I don't think going through it, you're so focused on getting through it. Sometimes there's not time to look for where the help is. And I think in my case, that may have been some of the shortcomings that, um, that, I mean, for yourself, I know I spoke to you as, um, as a, as a support and a friend, but beyond those, I didn't really have any formal group support group that I could go and speak to. There's a lot of, um, shame and stigma around dementia. Mm. As a woman of color, yeah, it's, did you yeah. feel that you had to either hide it or you did not feel comfortable discussing it with a lot of your friends? So how did you feel? No, I think I'm from a different generation. I know my mom, if she knew I had told anyone about it, she would be devastated. It's probably good that she was in a dementia state and she couldn't, um, she didn't know. I was telling other folks when she was going through her cancer um, journey, I couldn't tell anybody. There was no support because she admonished me for no one is supposed to know <laughs> that she's sick. Um, for me, it wasn't that stigma. I I spoke about it um, and I seek help where I could get help. So sickness to me is not something that I think I need to hide from anyone I share and I find in sharing, there are so many other folks who are going through a similar situation that that sharing actually brings about some sense of relief and some sense that I'm not really alone. Yeah. Because I spoke to folks at work and it's like, yeah, my mom's going through that or my dad's going through that or my dad went through it and it was hell. And so there is that kind of informal support by just organically sharing with other folks. But I know there are formal organizations out there that, that can step in. 
Okay, that's good. And then um, after you went through all this, I mean, I know you had to do a lot, like you said, with in terms of home care, because you tried your best to get your mom's pressure sore healed. You, you mm -hmm. did a lot. And I know you were always, you know, present, um, you know, you know, challenges with, with um, wound care nurses and so forth. You, oh, Lord, you were yeah. at the forefront. <laughs> advocating for your mother in as you reflect back what are some of the insights or lessons that you learned that you think people listening to us could benefit from um definitely be an advocate <laughs> even when they're telling you like get out of here kind of thing they may not say it like that but advocacy isn't always welcomed in in these settings I advocated in the hospital for them not, they wanted me to almost terminate her life. She lasted a, a year after they said, let her die. So advocate for life. Um, as a religious Christian person, I would, couldn't have lived with myself if I had gone with, we'll just kind of medicate her until she passed. Couldn't do that. So advocate, I, uh, gave her i had them do the the feeding too because she wasn't taking things orally um and she just blossomed after she actually got some nutrients in her even though they tell me it's going to be painful it's going to be infected and i could teach people right now on how to do feeding tubes i could do wound care i probably could could be certified as a wound care specialist <laughs> but lessons learned is it's the the system is understaffed. The people are overtaxed with with clients, so you're not getting the kind of care that you really should get. Um, I found it so frustrating, even when you get the hour that folks they're they're sending somebody to New Market, and you're in Toronto, and it's a twenty minute drive, but you only have an hour, and so they can only stay with you in those short periods. So. Lessons learned, you have to complement or supplement the care that's being given or offered by the community with your own care. And I know it's it's hard because it's costly to, to pay for care, but it's something that I think we as folks getting older have to put into our plan. It's almost a retirement plan where we need to plan for being sick. And dementia is a, I think it's an epidemic. Yeah, so it is a global um, epidemic. It is epidemic. It, it's it's insane that so many people suffer from it, and it's not really curable. So many of us are going to go down yeah, that path. So be prepared. On the on the contrary, science is actually not it's just, yeah. It, you know, I'll let you speak on that one. Yeah, like we now hearing about things like Alzheimer's, which is the one uh, that has no cure and you know they're now calling that a type 3 diabetes right so that was shocking to hear <laughs> so there's a lot of things about self-care and lifestyle changes apparently up to 40 percent of uh the, the the you can prevent alzheimer's up to 40 percent of um the time and then the other one, like, you know, I, as you know, I write children's books, right? Right. Vascular dementia is one also. And even because they are referring to Alzheimer's as type 3 diabetes, it's, it's now, it's also a, a, a vascular disease. So right. if you are able to mitigate vascular diseases like high blood pressure, diabetes, high blood cholesterol, stuff like that, and, you know, mm -hmm. like a lot goes into a healthy lifestyle. Sleep is important. Stress management is important. Community. There are so many yes. things you have to do. So that is why a lot of, there's a lot of talk about dementia. I like to talk about the preventative aspect of it. What can we do to make mm -hmm. sure we don't develop this disease, right? You know, so I'm sure that there's um, a lot that can be done. And uh, and as um, science continues to expand, I'm sure there'll be more and more. Um, I was talking to my cousin in Australia, which is a doctor at one of the hospitals. They're actually developing a an app that can help people detect 
even 20 years in advance uh, oh, wow. have you know uh the the risk for for dementia and i said please when you complete it let's have some <laughs> yeah, you know so yes and, yes and, yeah. and, and and more and more dementia is coming to the limelight unfortunately mm -hmm. It's growing at an outstanding rate. Like, I mean, it's the, the research out there, especially even from the, the Alzheimer's of Canada, where we are going from uh, 500 and something thousand to over a million in just six years. So we really need to tighten our seatbelts, you know, do what we can yeah. for ourselves. And also be more proactive with our loved ones when we start to see signs and symptoms because early detection is very important you know there are medications that can prolong stages of this disease and yeah. also be very familiar with your numbers because um, you can develop little strokes from vascular diseases that will lead to vascular dementia but the good thing about vascular dementia if you can say that is that once you mitigate that problem the damage stops it does not continue. You cannot regrow the brain cells, but you can prevent mm -hmm. more damage from happening. It's like at Alexis Lodge, I've had two people that have been living with us for 20 years. One of them who is a school teacher. Uh, mm -hmm. He hasn't changed much. And um, the other day I went to him and I said, do you remember what an eclipse is? And he went ahead and told me exactly what it is, right? I was so happy. I'm like, yes, you know. So um, there's so much more that can be done for people with dementia. The other thing is that people often think, oh, you get it, a, a dementia diagnosis is the end of life. You can't do any, mm. more, anything anymore, but it's not yeah. true. There's still much right. to be lived. And the goal is to support people and help them to live good quality of life. Let's try to eradicate that stigma that hangs around old age, ageism, mm -hmm. dementia, mental illness, all these things. Like, let's, you know, be more open, let's understand the disease more, because especially with some seniors, they think it's something that they can catch. So they're scared. They don't want, you know, so, but if we, understand it then we are able to be more sensitive and respectful mm -hmm. of people and uh, be able to provide activities stimulation keeping the mind active you know keeps the mind going right exactly. so, and uh, i was i think yes, when i did my last podcast i was talking to a lady just for you with your uh, website and bringing uh, information to the black community we need to talk about this more in the BIPOC communities. And that is... Oh, my goodness. Yeah. I started a Rosso Grammar Wellness Hub. We need to talk about it. Nobody subscribes to dementia. Disease is nothing to hide. It's like, yeah, even exactly. if that disease, when the person dies, can you still hide it? No, right? No, yeah, exactly. So speak yeah. up. Let's talk about it. Yeah. Let's see what we can do. Let's join us you know together mm -hmm. and see how we can unravel dementia because yeah. we definitely yeah. can unmask it and when when something is no longer hidden like the saying goes the problem known is half solved right so when yes. we know what it is when we know some signs and they are different with everybody like but yeah. i hear from you i hear from someone else and maybe my loved ones is in in between but i will still mm -hmm. get some ideas from what i've heard Exactly. And, exactly. And, and people tend to want to listen to someone that has had similar experience to them. Mm -hmm. right? It's like when you don't know what you're talking about, people don't want to listen to you. But you, with your impression, you know, uh, experience and, you know, just listening to what you went through, I'm sure that one or two persons would oh, yeah. one, one. resonate with them and will impact them in one way or the other. No, a hundred percent. And I think you've talked about a lot of the lessons that, that um, need to be learned. And one of them, of course, is what you're doing here right now is to educate yourself. Educate yourself before dementia comes hitting on your door, because as you say, it probably could be preventable. And a, couple, a few other things. Know your parents' affairs. 
oh, yeah. like no know, know what's going on with them i mean trying to find out where things are after they're not all there is not good i mean for me even insurance insurance lapsed because i didn't realize what was happening um within our community talking about that is like oh so you want to see me die or something it's, taboo. We're, we're, yes. <laughs> it's a taboo right we don't talk about it but one of the hardest thing was decide would she want to continue like that should i listen to the doctor and let them just let her die like do i do dnr like all these things that are going through your head what should i do what would they have liked to do how, do they want to be cremated? Do they want to be buried? Like we never talked about any of Living, those things. Oh, POA, yeah. all these things. All well. those things. Po yeah. Once Power of attorney. Oh. 20, 30, you should have one. Now they you, yeah, you should have. Yeah, exactly. You know, so that someone can look after your affair. Look because after trying you to your... those banking things changed and all after? the documents. It's so it's, difficult. And it's costly. very difficult. And costly yeah. too. You know? and, and costly so those yeah you, you really need to get involved it's hard because my mom was very private and sometimes even asking about those things was i was fearful to, mm -hmm. to, to you ask right because you're yeah. uncomfortable mm -hmm. and yeah. it doesn't matter how old you are i think with your parents you always feel like a child and so um bro broaching those subjects were were not things I thought about doing, but in hindsight, I should have, even though it would have been hard. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. This is good for all of us, you know, and those of us that are parents, you know, be a little bit more open with our children. <laughs> exactly. I mean, for my daughter, I said, okay, I need to put you on all my accounts. I, I trust her. <laughs> I need to put, be on my account because there are also tax implications. And that's the other thing. Talk to um, lawyers, talk to tax accountants, and so on to see how your 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 estate is going to impact your loved ones. Sometimes there's debt to pay and inheritance and all that, so you need to have those discussions. Yeah, yeah, that is awesome. Thank you so much, Hazen. You're very well. Interesting, welcome. and uh, again, I, I applaud you for the care that you gave to your mom. And I know, like the the young ones, were looking on. So you know, you yeah, hopefully they'll. they'll you've the already same. ensured your your old age. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I, I I truly hope so. Free. And um, so I do hope that everyone out there that is listening to us do take this seriously. Don't hide. If you have questions, if you suspect something, please seek professional help. There's out, help out there. There are lots of resources. Mm -hmm. It may be tasking for older people that are not technology savvy to find some of these resources. And that is one of those things that we're trying to do with the Rose for Grandma Wellness Hub to bring resources to primary care health centers family doctors, community centers. And that's why I started writing children's books so that from as early as um, elementary school age, people will know. Because in one of my books, like I think I've mentioned, it was a granddaughter who had heard about dementia from another mm -hmm. classmate that actually pointed the family into the right direction to find a suitable home for the grandma. So like children, should be talked about, uh, talked to about dementia. It should not be hidden. It's a family disease. It's not just right. an individual disease. And as a matter of fact, impacts the whole community. Because when children mm -hmm. don't know what's happening because of secrecy, especially in the BIPOC communities, they internalize yeah. the feelings. They start to think grandma or grandpa doesn't love them anymore. They start to think, you know, something is going on. No one is talking to me. No, no one loves me. Sometimes even they can develop anxiety, aggressive behaviors, and even as, you know, as serious as developing depression. So let's, mm -hmm. you know, be open and discuss dementia and look for ways and work together to prevent it. So thank you so much, John, for joining me this evening. And I hope that uh, we'll continue to do our best to unmask dementia. So have thank you very much. All the best. 
Thank you. And, and uh, we'll, 